uh, as opposed to a conductor. Give me an example of, of a conductor. Metals or conductors? Anything else? There are other... Yeah, water, and particularly water with uh, ions dissolved in it, right? So aqueous solutions, let's put it, put it that way. And let's just look at an example of a conductor. Let's say we have some salt water. So here is say, a beaker of water. And I've dissolved some ions in it. So I do, if I dissolve salt in it, the salt, the uh, ionic bond in the salt molecules breaks apart. And so you end up with positively charged sodium ions and negatively charged chloride ions, just kind of all floating free. Now, of course, this is a huge exaggeration here. But you get the idea. These, these ions are free to float about throughout the entire aqueous solution. And so they, these are the mobile charges. Okay. They're free to move about, free to float throughout the entire material. Okay. Another example is a metal. And metals are kind of special, and they're going to be extremely important in this course. We're going to be talking about the properties of metals over and over again. Uh, in those of you who took 205M probably remember the ball and springs model of a solid where we thought about the structure, the internal structure of a solid as behaving as if it were hard spheres connected to each other by spring-like forces. Okay. And so the hard spheres essentially were the atoms, and these were the interatomic bonds. Okay, and this whole this model is sometimes called the the lattice, okay, meaning the structure of the uh, of the atoms inside the material. We're gonna add on to our model of metals, of the internal structure, structure of metals, by saying not only is there the atoms and the interatomic bonds, which are essentially the inner electrons that are bound to each other, and these interatomic bonds are essentially the electrons that are bound to the atom, okay? But metals are kind of special in that they also give up at least one electron that is free to move about the entire object. Okay, so if I have a series of atoms in a lattice in a metal, this atom gives up an electron and now it has a, a nucleus plus a smaller number of electrons, so it actually has a positive charge now. And this atom gives up an electron, and this atom gives up an electron, and this atom gives up an electron, and this atom gives up an electron. Where do those electrons go? They go into what's called an electron C. So here is our block of metal. You can think of this as an electron C, a sort of free-floating ocean of electrons that are delocalized. They're not bound to any one particular atom. They're just kind of floating, in a sense, throughout the entire material, and they're free to move about. So you can think of the electrons almost like, like, a, uh, like a gas, where electrons are free to bounce around, jiggle around, move from one side to the other without, without anything impeding them, okay? at least as a first approximation. And We'll just kind of take this as our model of, of how things behave. For an explanation of why this is, you need uh, quantum mechanics to, to fully explain this. But one way you can picture this, and I'll show a little vPython program. So here's a model of a metal, okay? And you can see a series of positives. And those are what are called the atomic cores, or 
sometimes the ionic cores, because they are now ions, they have a single positive charge, which consists of the nucleus plus inner bound electrons. So those atomic cores are just sitting there, but each atomic core gives up a negative charge. It gives up a, a single electron. And those negative charges are free to kind of float about. You can think of this as electron C as being able to shift one way or the other, while the interior still stays neutral, because for every ionic core, there's a electron. Okay, so you can think of sort of the electrons as being superimposed over top the, uh, the atomic cores, and the interior still stays neutral. But if you have a case of polarization, let's say you bring a positive charge near a conductor, near a metal, Here's a positive charge, and here's a block of metal. Well, the electric field due to this positive charge is pointing that way. So we can think of this as the applied electric field. How do I draw the polarization? Well, interior, the, in, the interior stays neutral. What happens is the mobile charges shift, okay? So the electron C shifts a little bit. You can think of the applied electric field as exerting a force on the individual electrons, causing them to, the entire electron C to, sh to migrate from one side, migrate a little bit. So you can think of it as the electron C kind of sticks out a little bit on one side, okay? There's a greater probability of finding electrons a little bit out of the surface, okay, in some sense. And that leads to an excess negative charge on that side. And if their electron C is shifted that way, you're going to have an excess positive charge on, on that side. Okay? So that's the basic idea. Okay? Mobile charges inside, and this has a number of different consequences. One is... Again, polarization is a shifting of the mobile charges. In this case, the electron C, if you're talking about a metal. Excess charge well, think about if I tried to charge up a, a piece of metal or a conductor. If I placed any excess charge in the interior, say somehow I was able to inject some negative charge in the interior, those charges in the interior are free to move about. If I have a concentration of negative charge in the interior, what's it going to do? It's going to pull positive charges in. Well, the positive charges are the atomic cores, right? They're pretty much static because they're made up of the nuclei, and the nuclei are really heavy, and so there really isn't anywhere for them to go, or they can't be really pulled that much. Yeah, Luke. Okay, so the electrons on the outside will be repelled. So let's think of it this way. Here's an electron. It's next to a whole bunch of other electrons. It's going to experience what type of force? to be pushed in what direction? Kind of outward, right? So that electron gets pushed outward. Here's another excess electron that's near a whole bunch of excess electrons. It gets pushed outward. So the end result is that when everything settles down, the excess charge is only going to be on the surface. So for a metal, excess charge can't be in the interior. It can only be on the surface.
And even on the surface, it tends to spread out. Okay? If I tried to place, even if it were on the surface, if I tried to place some excess electrons on this piece of metal just at this location, well, again, we have the same problem, right? The electrons are going to be repelling each other. They're free to move about throughout the entire material. And so you'll see after a short amount of time, a nanosecond, a very you know, a split second, the electrons will try to spread out as much as possible over the entire surface. So you can't just place excess charge on one little patch like you could with the, uh, with the insulator. It tends to spread out over the entire surface material. Okay. We can quantify this a little bit by actually being a bit more precise about our model of a metal. And this is something called the, the Druda model, which is kind of a basically what we said. We're, we're saying it's a it's positively charged atomic cores mobile electrons superimposed on top of these atomic cores and we're just dealing with it as in the sort of classical way and not involving any quantum mechanics. Okay, so that's that's called the Druda model. So in the Druda model you have these mobile electrons. Let's say you were able to somehow apply an electric field in here. So here's our conductor. And let's say here's some positive charge over here. And that is going to produce some electric field, applied electric field in that direction. And we're looking at the mobile electrons inside. Let's just focus on a single electron, okay? Electron is completely free to move around, and now there's an electric field in that direction, right? So what's going to cause what? There's going to be a force on the electron that way, right? From F equals QE. Well, if there's a force on a mobile charge, or force on any object, what does that cause? Acceleration, right? So the electron would speed up. If we were to plot the speed of an electron in this applied electric field versus time, it would look something like this. So the electron starts, let's say, at rest. It increases in speed due to the applied force, the applied electric field. But every so often, a mobile electron is going to collide with one of these positively charged interatomic cores. Okay, Collides with a core and basically loses all of its momentum, loses all of its, uh, its speed, gives up its kinetic energy to the atomic core, and so the electron speed drops down to zero. Well, there's still this force here due to the applied electric field, and so the speed increases again, but maybe now it collides with the core here, drops down to zero. Speed increases again, or maybe goes on for a little while, collides with the core, drops down to zero, and this keeps going over and over, and you get this sort of sawtooth-looking graph. If I were to average all this out, we'd find some average speed for the mobile electron. And this average speed I'm going to call V bar, V with a little bar over it. This is called the average speed or the drift speed. Okay. So on average, the electron moves on a roughly average constant speed with an applied electric field because of this sort of frictional force where it's constantly colliding with the, uh, the uh, atomic cores and slowing down and speeding up and colliding and slowing down. So that relationship, that behavior is parameterized with an equation which says that the drift speed of in mobile charges inside a metal is equal to U times the electric field. What is U? U is called the mobility, okay? And its units are just uh, meters per second over newtons per coulomb. There's no special unit for it. 
it's just giving the mobility of the of the of the charges how easily they can move how fast they will move given a particular applied electric field okay so given this there's a special case when the average speed is equal to zero when the electrons overall net is are not moving we call this situation static equilibrium So, static equilibrium, charges aren't moving. Well, let's look at what's possible and what isn't when we have a situation of static equilibrium. Here's V, let's make a little table. V and the net electric field inside the material. Let's say V is not equal to zero. E not equal to zero. Is that possible? Sure. But is it a case of static equilibrium? No, this is not static equilibrium. V not equal to zero and E equal to zero. Is that possible? Mm -mm. This equation says it can't be, so not possible. V equal to zero and the electric field not equal to zero. Is that possible? Nope. There's only one possibility left when we're in static equilibrium. That is, if we're in static equilibrium, if the drift speed of these mobile electrons is equal to zero, the net electric field has to be equal to zero. So this is the only possibility in static equilibrium. They say, wait a minute, how can that be possible? Because let's say we have this situation. Here's a neutral block of metal. I bring a positive charge near this neutral block of metal, and now this positive charge is applying an electric field, so I'll call this, uh, let's see, I'll call this charge one, just to distinguish. And so this is E1 due to charge one, okay? What's going to happen to the mobile charges in here? They're going to shift, right? And so the negative charges, the negative electrons in the electron C would shift in what direction? That way. So I'm going to end up drawing electrons over here positive charges over here. But now I have a separation of charge. What do those charges create inside that material? Okay, there it's a dipole, creates a dipole. So the charges, just think about superposition, right? Here's the electric field due to this charge, but now we have electric fields contributed by the charges on these surfaces, right? So you think about the, uh, the right side and the left side. At the same observation location, what's the electric field due to the charges on that left side? What's the direction? That way, yeah. What's the electric field due to the charges on the right side? Same direction. When I add it all up, what's happened to the electric field? It, it, the, the, the net electric field has, well, not just, okay, well, it's changed. Has it changed direction? Well, maybe not yet, right? If I add this, if this is, say, fairly large, and I add these two together, then it's, if I add these, these two vectors in the opposite direction, I've changed the, the size, right? So the, the net electric field's gone down. 
we still have some net electric field, so charges will continue to move because of V equals UE, and so the charge builds up even more on one side and on the other. And if the charges increase here, then these electric field sizes increase. And when does it all stop? When it's equal to zero, when the net electric field is equal to zero. Okay. So there's some, when you bring a charge nearby, there's some short amount of time when things aren't in static equilibrium. The charges are moving about, okay, and things are shifting. When does it stop? When does that shifting stop? When the electric field is equal to zero. So this is an important result. The net electric field inside a conductor at static equilibrium is zero. And it's one of those sentences where every single word is absolutely important. It's not just the electric field due to a single object, it's the net electric field due to everything. It's not in an insulator, it's in a conductor. We're talking about static equilibrium, not cases like in a circuit where we'll see later on where there are charges moving continuously. We're talking about a static equilibrium situation, so V is equal to zero. V bar, I should say, is equal to zero. And the net electric field is equal to zero. Okay, So that encapsulates a lot, but it's extremely important to understand. Okay. Questions?